Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Lincoln on this Sunday morning. My name is the Reverend Oscar Sinclair. Each week since the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic last year, our congregation has gathered together at least twice. On Thursday night, when we tend to our community and each other directly on Zoom, and in this service on Sunday morning, broadcast on YouTube. And Sunday morning, whether in person or on YouTube, is a chance to proclaim who we are and what we're about, throwing open the doors of the congregation and proclaiming the radical love and welcome that is at the heart of our faith. The Unitarian Church of Lincoln, we say, aspires to be a loving community, uniting reason with spiritual exploration to transform ourselves and the world. And right now, in what we hope, what we believe are the closing months of this pandemic, we know that transformation is necessary, that we cannot go back to the world as it was. Arundhati Roy wrote at the start of this pandemic that historically pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging all that we have, or we can walk through lightly, with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and to fight for it. What other world will we imagine? How will we bring it into being? Step lightly and with little luggage, beloveds, there is still much work to be done. Our opening words this week come from Ian Riddell. We call out to the world and say, come into the circle of love and justice. And we are called here to learn how to relate in love, to learn how to know and build that justice. We call out to the world and say, come into the community of mercy, holiness, and health. And we are called here to the imperfect practice of making mercy real, of deepening our spiritual connections of learning how to nurture each other towards health. We call out to the world and say, come and you shall know peace and joy. And we are called here, today and each day we gather, to create an active peace of kindness, justice, and deep listening, to find joy in celebrating who we are as individuals and together. And so we call out and say, come and worship. And so we are called to worship today. Hello. Our story today is called Imagine a Place by Sarah Thompson. Imagine a place where you bend and sway, leap and land, right where our story begins. Imagine a place where water is solid, light is liquid, and sky a frozen river under your feet. Imagine a place where your mind opens wider than any walls around you. Imagine a place where freedom is as sweet as falling water, light as a feather welcomed into the gentle air. Imagine a place where spring becomes an avalanche of blossoms, a torrent of sweetness overflowing on the earth. Imagine a place where your ship holds all you once knew and offers and arrives all you will ever need. Imagine a place where time is counted by ticks and talks, but space is measured in sunsets. Imagine a place where each turn takes you home. Imagine a place where the tang of pine meets the salt of the sea, where adventure finds a waiting heart. Imagine a place where words shall shelter you, ideas uphold you, and thoughts lead you to the secret inside the labyrinth. Imagine
imagine a place where brick and mortar dig deep roots, where buds unfurl as soft as sunlight, strong as stone. Imagine a place where fire is cool against your skin, a glimmering echo of a star. Imagine a place where music sings in every breeze of a summer's night and the wind twirls you in a waltz that lasts until dawn. Imagine a place where castle and cloud shift from square to square and the world lies in the winner's hand. Imagine a place where the sign of surf and the whisper of waves spill from your suitcase and drift into your dreams. Imagine here. And that is the end of our story. Each week we take up an offering to support everything that goes on here at the Unitarian Church of Lincoln. As the next song plays, if you feel so inclined, please text UC Lincoln and the amount you'd like to give to 73256. That's UC Lincoln and the amount to 73256. Thank you so much for your support of everything we do here at the Unitarian Church of Lincoln. These are the words of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I use this subject because there are literally two Americas. One America is flowing with the milk of prosperity and the honey of equality. That America is the habitat of millions of people who have food and material necessities for their bodies, culture and education for their minds, freedom and human dignity for their spirits. That America is made up of millions of young people who grow up in the sunlight of opportunity. <clears throat> but as we assemble here tonight, I'm sure that each of us is painfully aware of the fact that there is another America, 
And that other America has a daily ugliness about it that transforms the buoyancy of hope into the fatigue of despair. In that other America, millions of people find themselves forced to live in inadequate, substandard, and often dilapidated housing conditions. In these conditions, they don't have wall-to-wall -wall carpets, but all too often they find themselves living with wall-to-wall -wall rats and roaches. In this other America, thousands, yea, even millions of young people are forced to attend inadequate, substandard, inferior, qualityless schools. And year after year, thousands of young people in this other America finish our high schools reading at an eighth and ninth grade level. Not because they are dumb, not because they don't have innate intelligence, but because the schools are so inadequate, so overcrowded, so devoid of quality, so segregate, segregated, if you will, that the best in these minds can never come out. And probably the most critical problem in the other America is the economic problem. By millions, people in the other America find themselves perishing on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. We only need to look at the facts and they tell us something tragic. The fact is that the black man in the United States of America is facing a literal depression. Now you know they don't call it that. When there is massive unemployment in the black community, it's called a social problem. But when there is massive unemployment in the white community, it's called a depression. With the black man, it's welfare. With the whites, it's subsidies. This country has socialism for the rich, rugged individualism for the poor. We share a time for joys and sorrows as we gather here each week in person or online. We have much to mourn these times of pandemic, not the least of which is not being able to spend time with each other in person each Sunday. This is a time of sorrow, and yet it can also be a time of joy. May we each discover ways to hold joy during this next week. As you listen to this next song, please type your name or the name of someone whom you would like us to hold in joy or in sorrow in the chat box. Thank you for your presence. more from Dr. King. And I close by saying that let all of us assembled here continue to struggle for peace and justice. And you know, they do go together. I know there are those who still think they can be separated. They mention to me all the time. There are those who sincerely feel that, but I answered a man the other day who told me I should stick to civil rights and not deal with the war thing and the war question in Vietnam. I told him that I had been fighting too long and too hard now against segregated public accommodations to end up segregating my moral concerns. And the fact is that justice is indivisible. Injustice anywhere is a threat 
to justice everywhere. And the other thing is, we've got to come to see that however much we've misunderstood or criticized for taking a stand for justice or for peace, we must do it anyway. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. And I say that if we stand and work together, we will bring into being that day when justice will roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. We will bring into being that day when America will no longer be two nations, but when it will be one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. What are the stories that bind us together? Most ministers have one or two sermons that they just keep preaching using different words through their entire career over and over again. What's my job, the Reverend Cheryl Walker said, but to preach that a better world is possible and then, when there's another week worth of evidence to the contrary, repeat myself. Some ministers preach love, some grace. For me, the story, the sermon, that I keep coming back to over and over again is about story and how we imagine our connections. A week and a half ago, I came home here in upstate New York where I am for a couple months to find my father waiting on the front porch of their house. Protesters have breached the Capitol building. Now, I knew this before I had left the house. I had a, a news alert that some barriers had come down in some kind of melee at the, the rally that day in Washington, D.C. No, it's worse, he told me. The Capitol has been breached. And I, I walked into the house to see the extraordinary images coming out of Washington, D.C. And then, because life goes on, and even the most world-changing events bow to an empty stomach, I started cooking dinner. But here's what I wrote that first night over a pot of rice and beans. But I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. I took that oath along with millions of other federal employees, current and former, and like many of them, I thought hard about what it meant before taking it. And I've thought sense about what it asks of us. In the dozen years since I stood up and took it, other obligations have only deepened that commitment. It's not an oath to a person. It's not an oath to a country, a mythic homeland that we owe our allegiance to. It's an oath to uphold a process an idea. The events at the Capitol today I wrote a week and a half ago do not have two sides. This is lawlessness. This is an attack on the process. And the obligation for all of us that took that oath and for all of us that are proud to be citizens of this country is to that process. It's as simple as that. Of course, it's never actually as simple as that. So what is the story that we owe allegiance to, that binds us together as a country? If one thing is clear after the last 11 days, it's that we do not all answer that question the same way. But let's be clear about the story that we, as Unitarian Universalists in Lincoln, Nebraska, tell, because stories are how we imagine our relationships into being, from the relationships that we have with each other to the relationship we have with a country. There are a few different ways to think about our relationship with the country that we live in. We could embrace it, and many churches do, especially right now. There's a place where theology and nationalism meet that sees the United States of America as a shining city on a hill, blessed by geography, history, and culture to be the greatest nation in history. This is a, a sentiment that has been shared across party lines, across eras of American history. But in its most extreme form, the 
form that we've seen in the last two weeks, it becomes a kind of unrepentant, unconstrained nationalism, ignorant of history and enraged at the reality of change. We could also go in the other direction, that there is nothing special about the accident of birth or circumstance that ends with us living in Lincoln, Nebraska. We could claim that we are subject to the laws of the country we live in simply by default, that we owe no particular allegiance to the United States of America. We could go further than that. The history of this country is a bloody and awful, often evil one. And far from being a city on a hill blessed by geography and history, many of us find ourselves on land that our ancestors stole in a country built on the back of enslaved people, benefiting from a capitalist culture that practically requires deep structural inequality to function. And that's a true story. And I can't fault anyone for holding it, especially, especially in months like this one. I do hope there's a third way though. I certainly hope it for me. I meant what I said last week about taking that oath seriously, and that compels me to try and reconcile the reality of this country's history with the beauty of its aspirations. Fifteen years ago, <clears throat> I presented a paper at an American Academy of Religion conference on the, the confluence of religion and nationalism in the formation of apartheid in South Africa. Much of that paper was based on the writing of Benedict Anderson, a, a professor at Cornell University, about 10 miles from where I am right now, who tried to develop a conceptual, a conceptual framework for nationalism. Anderson ties the birth of the modern idea of the nation to the development of the printing press in the 15th century. Nationalism, in his way of thinking, is the community that is formed when a population is too big for every individual to know each other, but still has some kind of collective identity. You can think of it this way. We have a, a certain allegiance to our family. And now, for some folks, this is a complicated relationship, but it's often one of mutual love and support in the group of people that we live with, whether that's family of birth or, or family of choice. And we can think about a larger network of allegiances to our extended family, to our friends, to our church community. And then after that, it gets a little bit more nebulous. There are 320,000 people in Lincoln, Nebraska. I will never meet all of them. What makes us a community? and not simply a group of people sharing the same space. This is even more important for me now because I'm not currently in Lincoln, Nebraska. So what makes me a part of the Lincoln, Nebraska community, even though I am not there right now? Benedict Anderson would say that it is our imagination. We are able to imagine a community tied together with mutual commitments and interest, in part because of mass communication. In the Lincoln example, I can imagine myself as part of a shared community as I read Stephen Sipple's article in the Journal Star about the haplessness of Nebraska football's special teams unit this fall. Now, I know that I will never meet most of the people that I pass on the road in Lincoln, but I can also imagine that in a pinch, we might have a shared sense of identity, of experience. Nationalism is like this, Anderson says, but writ large, it is dependent on our imagination as having a shared experience with folks that we have not met. And that shared experience is communicated through mass media. And just because it is imaginary does not actually lessen its impact. Even, especially, because something is imaginary, it can be very, very real. 
But here's an interesting piece of Anderson's thought. Unlike some of his predecessors, unlike many of the folks who write about nationalism now, he didn't actually see the idea of an imagined community as inherently negative. He saw it as a, a logical outgrowth of mass media. He was a sociologist. So it was a fact that could be harnessed for positive or negative ends. In his, for, excuse me, in his formulation then, nationalism is very much like religion. So what ties us to Unitarian Universalism? There are 150,000 uh, Unitarian Universalists in the country spread out over a thousand congregations. That's often a small and insular community, but even within our community, we don't actually all know each other. What we do have is an imagined community. I share experiences and commitments with Unitarian Universalists from San Jose to Tampa Bay. And while I have not met them, we share a community. And we share a sense of the world that we are working together to build. We say we are a covenantal people as Unitarian Universalists, and this is the essence of covenant, that we are united by an idea, the goal of building a better community together, even when we are not actually physically together, even when we don't know each other. Tomorrow is Martin Luther King Day, and King wrote about the beloved community it's the goal that we are working towards, the shared commitment that ties us together in community right now, right here. We're going to talk a lot more about that in February. Beloved community is our monthly theme next month. But for now, let me say that, that beloved community is what we call in theology a kind of realized eschatology, a promised land that is concrete and is built from our actions and our love that reflect the love and the action of God in this world. But we didn't start these reflections with theology. We started these reflections with America in January of 2021. In the next seven days, a new president will be inaugurated I'm recording this sermon on Thursday night. I imagine that things will have changed between the time I record it on Thursday night and the time that we are watching it together on YouTube on Sunday morning. It seems likely that sometime in the next weeks, Donald Trump will go on trial in the Senate for inciting insurrection. I do have hope, actually. <laughs> that at some point in my ministry, there will be fewer historical crises that demand a response from the pulpit, but that is not this month. The kind of nationalism that Donald Trump has espoused for a decade of public life for the last five years, either running for president or being in the White House, is a force for evil in the world. And there is no question here. There's no complicated theological point to be made. It's wrong, it's evil, and we will all be better off for its exit from public life. A sense of the nation or community that depends on excluding others is antithetical to everything we say in this church. The results over the last four years have been horrific. I, I have lost count of the number of, of sermons I have given, the number of one-on-one -on -one meetings that I've had, the number of committee meetings that begin with us all just looking at each other and, and saying, can you believe what's happened? This may be who America has always been. Donald Trump is the, the latest in a long legacy of American hatred and bigotry and violence. But that, that just cannot be the only story. 
folks who take the, the federal oath of office, don't swear allegiance to Donald Trump. They don't swear allegiance to a person. It's not an oath to a country. It's an oath to uphold a process, an idea, a figment of imagination, no less real for being imaginary. It is an imagined community that calls us to our highest aspirations. It is a covenant, and covenants are aspirational. And we know, because we talk about covenant a lot here, that we can't expect that everybody will follow covenant at all times. But what covenants do, from the covenant we have as a congregation, to the constitution, to the implicit covenant we have as citizens, is the capacity to say, this is out of bounds. This is wrong because it is not who we aspire to be together. That is the genius of this country. It's not blood and soil nationalism. It's not a person. It's a nationalism that exists in a covenant. We the people is a covenantal statement. It is a statement of faith in an imagined community. We will take care of one another. It says, we will do as best we can for the next generation. We will recognize that our systems are imperfect and we will amend them to bring greater justice. That's the story that we're a part of. That's the community that we imagine together. And as we do so, we bring, up, we bring about the beloved community that we dream of. Amen and blessed be. For the past several years, I've been a member of AUUMM, the Association for Unitarian Universalist Music Ministry. It's a professional organization that brings together UU musicians and music directors from all over the country. It's been a great, great organization to be a part of. The collegiality and professionalism of my colleagues in AUUMM is really unmatched. And for a while, our own Julie Anderson was the executive director of this organization. So needless to say, our ties to AUUMM run deep. Now, you may recall in the newsletter a little while back, I shared a quote from Leonard Bernstein who said, This will be our reply to violence, to make music more intensely, more beautifully, more devotedly than ever before. And that's just what myself and my colleagues in AUUMM are trying to do. With a special thanks to Sarah Jebian, who is the music director at the Unitarian Church in Rockville, Maryland, We've put together something that celebrates the life and work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who said, God has wrought many things out of oppression. He has endowed his creatures with the capacity to create, and from this capacity has flowed the sweet songs of sorrow and joy that have allowed man to cope with his environment and many different situations. We hope you enjoy King for a Day.